Hey everyone, my name is David Eberts, and we are going to look at cell to ECM interactions. How all those components that are mentioned in my other video, um, how they can actually interact with the cell. Long story short, it's done by just this super family called integrin. And it, integrin is basically, there's tons of different types of integrins, but what they are, they are transmembrane proteins. transmembrane proteins that can reach out and grab parts of the ECM. So we have some cells here and underneath them of course is the ECM which as a quick review will contain stuff like collagen, proteoglycans, proteoglycans, lamina, and then fibronectin. Ah. So these integrins are transmembrane, meaning they're on the membrane and that they're on both sides. So that's where the trans is. So we're going to color them in in red. They extend to both sides of the membrane so they can stick out and interact with stuff that's inside the ECM. And Basically, when we were talking about um, how uh, the, in my other video when I talk about extracellular matrix, these can bind on to RGD loops. RGD loops in, fib in fibronectin and other things such as lamina, and thus can interact and signal and move or stay there, grow, don't grow, etc. But integrin are transmembrane proteins that help signaling as well as uh, just connection. So collagen and fibronectin and lamina are all things that add strength to cells and what they can sit on and they can grab onto it and connect with it and keep the cells in place. And in addition, they can signal each other. So things that happen in the extracellular matrix can signal the cell to do things based on the integrin being the intermediate middleman. So let's look at how integrins work generally and the structure you need to know about them. Uh, come on. All right, so drawing, this is a cell membrane. We have outside and then we have inside. We have that integrins are, at least in our case in the book and in class, are this di height or this dimer formation, let me draw that, sorry, where they have two identical strands, which I'll draw in different colors that are right next to each other. And this is basically the inactivated state, inactive. And they kind of have this sad, droopy face look. So they have an uh, extracellular domain a juxtaposed domain and an intracellular domain. And this intracellular domain has alpha and beta tails is what they call this. And these are the heads. So in the inactive form, what causes it to be inactive is the fact that the alpha and beta heads, ah, sorry, alpha and beta tails are connected to each other. So they almost inhibit each other just by being present and next to each other. So it's not the fact that this region's close to each other or the heads are next to each other, it's the fact that alpha and beta tails are bound. So if we could somehow get it to where the alpha and beta tails were separate, beta, alpha, we would then have active integrins. And now they like the heads shoot up and are looking up in a sense. So they go from down to up. And if we could separate alpha and beta tails, it'll activate. So this is now the active form. And the thing that does that, and what we looked at a whole bunch, was the cytoplasmic protein ta talon. So talon can come in and separate out the two tails. 
So essentially, that's how you can regulate the on and off of integrins by the talon coming and in integrating. So an important thing to note then is if we were to form a mutant where we delete the alpha and beta tails, I think we went over this in class, if we were to make a mutant where we have just the juxtapose and the extracellular domain of each, they're still bound because we never separated them with talon, we're just mutating so there's no alpha and beta, so no cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic tail. This is mutant. It would actually still be activated. So the integrin heads will be standing up nice, right, and happy, and can be active and integrate with things in the extracellular matrix. Because, as we mentioned, it's not the fact that they're bound together, it's the fact that the alpha and beta, alpha and beta tails are bound to each other. So we'll once again have an active integrin. All throughout this, whenever it gets activated, then it can interact with things in the extracellular matrix, as we talked about. It could bind onto collagen, which can be drawn something like this, and grab onto it, give it strength. Or it could talk and connect with fibronectin, Which would, act, which would bind at the RGD loop. I talked about in my other video, if you want to go look at that. It's basically the binding domain of where cells can bind onto certain things in the extracellular matrix. And that's how integrins generally work. So how you can regulate it is how the alpha and beta tails interact, but also you can regulate it by talon. Because talon, just like anything, we will look in the nucleus here, and we have some part of the, the gene for talon. You can upregulate or regulate this whole process by affecting the transcription and translation and effect and expression of talon. So you can cancel this out to lead to no talon and basically lead to an inactive form. Or the opposite, you can upregulate it and lead to an always active form of integrin. And that's how the cell can connect and work with all this. One last thing I'll mention about this is that the whole process of outside and inside the cell are connected. So collagen connects with the integrin and to give it the full strength and stability, talon and other things may be connected to uh, cytoskeleton features such as actin. and it may even be bound over here or so, it doesn't really matter. But what's important is that we have cytoskeleton interaction, and we see that we have an extracellular to integrin to cytoskeleton complex, which overall makes this just this huge foundation of a structure that the cell can live on and not move around and get hurt. All right, uh, that's about it for how integrin works, which is the main way cells interact with ECM. Hope that helped.